Good morning. Thank you for braving the sleet uh, to come out and uh, be together to worship the Lord. My name is Joe. I'm one of the pastors here at Pleasant Valley. Very exciting uh, news these days at Pleasant Valley that not only did we say yes to Chad, he actually responded and says, okay, uh, uh, that he will join us. Isn't that good? That's awesome. Those of you who are joining us via stream, uh, thank you so much for doing that. Also, those of you in traditions, love you very much. Uh, glad you're part of our life and uh, the life of this church. Um, we're going to continue on in the book of Hebrews. And so before we do anything else, I'd like you to stand. And I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 20 through 40. If you want to look that up on your Bible underneath your seat or your phone, or you could certainly read along um, on the screen behind me. Several times in this chapter, 40 verses, it has this phrase, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. I think maybe the Holy Spirit wants us to think what it means uh, by faith. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let's listen to the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau, by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses... When he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, um, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others were stoned. They were sawn in two. Others, I'm sorry, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins and skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Father, we all recognize our humanity. We recognize, Father, that apart from something greater than ourselves coming and giving us insight and strength and perseverance, uh, we simply cannot live the type of life that our souls want to live. And thanks be to God, Father, you have given to us Jesus Christ, your Son, who has died, who's risen again, who has provided this thing called faith in you to bring about incredible amounts of grace, strength, so that we can live the life that we want to live, so that we can live the life that really honors you and reflects the glory of Jesus Christ. 
So we give you all the praise. We ask that you would help us in this time in your word uh, to take from it what your Holy Spirit has designed for us at this time in our, in our journey. And I pray, Father, that we would not only know what God's word says, but that we would follow through and do it. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. Jesus said this in Matthew 21. What do you think? He asked the questions. So the reader, you, myself, what do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two sons did the will of his father? They answered him the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This invitation to a life of faith is open to every human being in every generation under every circumstance. Would you agree? It is not for the spiritually elite. It's not for that particular culture that has a certain amount of enlightenment. It is not for uh, a culture or individuals in a culture that have been morally strong and robust for every human soul. It kind of causes every one of us to be humble before him, recognize that apart from him, there's no hope. And so this phrase, by faith, is so important. It changes everything for the human soul and the human walk. And, And so I commend you once again to God's word this morning as we think about what it means for you and for me to be people that live by faith. The question I want to answer this morning is, but what kind of faith is referred to here? What kind of faith? Um, Before I get in any further into the message, I want to highlight a passage out of 1 Kings. And I think, uh, Todd, you have that 1 Kings, I'm sorry, not 1 Kings, Jeremiah chapter uh, 32. This is what, this is what the Lord says. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. I will rejoice in doing good to them. We have a God in heaven who is on the edge of his seat, on the edge of heaven, as it were, wanting to bless your socks off. A God that is leaning into the human race, and uh, that possesses a heart that says, I want you to trust me. I want you to deeply believe that I care about you, that you matter to me. And so we get to rehearse historically those people that responded to the call of God, lean into the human race by faith. But what kind of faith? We see in this Jeremiah passage, God wants to be kind. He, it says he endures. He never runs out of this steam. He always is working and wanting to bless and to be, and to be good. That's the word used, to be good to you, to be good to me. And so the reason I'm prefacing The rest of what I'm going to say is because there's going to be a point in time when I talk about a certain kind of faith that isn't the kind of faith that God is looking for, okay? So I I needed to say that in case later you're like, oh, when we talk about the kind of faith that God does not respond to, okay? So you're you're warned, all right? Let's let's, uh, look at, uh, so there's a kind of faith that matters, It matters to God. It's very important that it matters to you and to me, right? Would you say that? It's not just enough for me to say, well, I believe. 
and then go on with your life. There is a type of belief, a type of faith, a kind of faith that the Bible teaches about that is so significant that the human soul and mind and, and, and uh, volition uh, walks into. And so uh, that's what we're going to work out. Now, now, here's a little bit of a hint that our author of the book of Hebrews was really interested in this. Back in Hebrews chapter 4, it says this, and it's going to be on the screen. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, God is leaning over. He wants to give you his peace, his rest. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Right away, we understand that there's a, there can be a type of faith that it fails to reach and to experience and to access God and all of his promises. Verse 2 in Hebrews chapter 4 says this, For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So there are two kinds of faith. There is a faith that works, and there is a faith that is dead. Jesus told the Pharisees, your faith is dead. It's all about dead works. You're trying to live a life that you've learned from the Scripture that, frankly, was not from the Scripture. It's dead. And so that should, and and even in this Hebrews 4 passage, it says we need to have some fear and even some trembling here as it relates to is my faith, as theologians call it, efficacious? Is, Is it effective? Is it real? Is it what God is looking for or not? Would you agree this is an important issue? And so that's why Hebrews 11 says, by faith, by faith, by faith. There's example after example after example. And so that's what we're going to work on together. Well, what kind of faith? And then back now into Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2, it says this. I'm going to actually read in verses 1 and 2. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now verse 2. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. They received their praise from God. They received their well done from God. The commendation. This kind of faith. The kind of faith that is assured of the things hoped for. These people received a commendation from God. So that also tells me that there is a condemnation from God. Would you agree? It, by, by definition, if there's a commendation, a faith that God says yes to, there's also a faith that God says, uh-uh. And we can remember certain, Old Test- or certain New Testament uh, gospel passages, Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 21, and a few verses there. There, there's some people, it says in that text, that would come to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, let us into your kingdom. And he says, I didn't even know you. Yeah, 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 but, but we prophesied in your name. We did miracles in your name. Come on, Jesus. He says, I didn't even know you. So there is this potentiality that you could get, and I could get all busy in ministry, doing incredible things, but it is not a reflection of the faith that God commends. Um, it's challenging, would you say? <coughs> it doesn't mean that I am uh, kind of outside of needing to evaluate and, and examine my own faith. Um, I ha- am in the, in the same boat as you are uh, because I have education and experience and all sorts of ministry time does not make it true that my faith is effective. There's something else uh, that is of greater value to God than even being a pastor. What are you laughing about, Joyce? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, come on. You know how special we are on the pastoral staff. Yeah, thank you, Joyce. I know I can count on you, yes. Jane, you make really good banana bread, by the way. Thank you. (laughs) There is a faith that God praises and a faith that is dead before God. There's a faith that God says, well done, and there's a faith that says, I didn't even know you. Do you get the tension? 
I want you to feel the tension of Scripture on this. It's necessary to get authentic and serious about our relationship with God and our connection to God, which is called a connection by faith. But there's a faith that is good and there's a faith that is not good. It's a faith that works. It's a faith that doesn't work. Okay, have I made my point? I will start all over. Are you with me? On this side, I have not heard any affirmations. All right, we'll just go over here and say this all over again. Yeah, all right, yeah, you're kind of over there, so that'll count. Thank Jane, uh, Jan for that one. Okay. Faith that God does not commend. We're going to work on that for just a few moments. The kind of faith that God says, uh-uh, to. Not well done, to. It's a faith focused on God's goodness to me. This is not something that God says, you got it. But this is a temptation for us believers. Would you agree? I, so so it, it has a condition on our side of the relationship to it, doesn't it? If you're good to me in the way that I think you should be good to me, then I'll trust you. It's a me-focused faith, and that is not the kind of faith. Now remember, God in Jeremiah says he's committed to our goodness. He never stops wanting to be good to us. But there is a type of faith that is focused on me that is not the kind of faith that God says, well done, Joe. I get it, I understand it, because God does want to be good to me, and he's proven himself over and over again. But it is not the kind of faith that gets things done in the kingdom of God. It is not the kind of faith that gets the attention of God. It is not the kind of faith that you want to have. And most of us in this room, if you're like me, have played with that one. Um, the next one, another kind of faith that God does not commend or praise or say well done to is biblical doctrine and creeds, a, a, a faith that's, that's focused on biblical doctrine and creeds. Now, this one also is, we're su- subject to, would you say, in Christendom, especially in our vein of Christendom, we hold high the Bible. We hold high the authority of Scripture. We hold high uh, systematic theology uh, premise. And so we, we are also subject to this kind of faith. But this kind of faith is the kind of faith that Jesus got after more than any other kind of faith that doesn't work. And it's the kind of faith that the Pharisees had. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the biblical scholars in the first century uh, were a target of Jesus Christ because their faith was not this efficacious kind of faith. It was not kind of the kind of faith God was looking for. It was a faith that was all about being right. Anybody ever had a, a, an issue in your life, or maybe people have tried to communicate with you? You just want to be right all the time? <laughs> you, you don't, no, nobody has ever said that to you? Okay. Well, Mary Beth will be at the second service. <laughs> and so I can say whatever I want in this service. Pastors are really, really, really um, vulnerable to this kind of faith. Because we're supposed to be answer people. Quick with the answer. Understand systematic theology so that we can explain things. But it's a kind of faith that God says, "Uh uh-uh, to. A focus on doctrine and creeds. And it sounds so right, doesn't it? Uh, a type of faith that's focused on God wanting to be good to me. It sounds so good. Uh, but it's not. And that's not when we read through this hall of faith in Hebrews 11. It's not the kind of faith that we hear by faith, by faith, by faith over and over again. Now, I am all into Bible study and systematic theology. I am all about wanting to understand truth. So don't hear me say that creed and doctrine and systematic theology and Bible study isn't important. It is, but it is not the foundation upon which my faith uh, is. For instance, if it was, then how would Rahab be approved by her faith? She didn't know any systematic theology. She knew some systems. 
right? There's something powerful about this faith that God is looking for. And God is looking for it this morning in your life. It's not okay just to come and, and, and to sit under the authority of God. You can sit under my authority and it doesn't matter, but this is God's authority. This morning, you need to allow yourself, your soul, to be examined by God's word and the truth in God's word. Not by how you've always operated. Because perhaps there's some adjustment that you need to make. I know this week there's been adjustments in my life studying this passage again. It's like, man, I can get really haughty about my faith. I mean, look, I compare myself to other people, right? Right? Wow. And so, let's be careful. A third kind, this is, this is more of a secular fault to faith, this third one. It's called the blind leap. It's a focus on a blind leap. It's kind of a haphazard uh, way to approach spirituality. Um, eh, you know, I don't really want to study that much. I don't really want to think that deep. I don't really want to wait and listen to the Lord and uh, hear His Word and respond to that. I just want to take a, a leap of faith, right? Uh, this is not the kind of faith God is looking for. Your faith, my faith, is built on good doctrine. It's not all about doctrine, but it's built on good teaching. It's built on understanding what the Scripture says, okay? All right. Fourth kind of faith, perhaps there's probably others, but these are the four that I chose to at least highlight for you this morning. Faith that God does not come in, number four, is personal reflection, a self-generated type of a faith. It comes from transcendental medita meditation. That used to be hot in the 60s and 70s. Now, those of you uh, who are younger are like, huh? Um, it is more New Age-ish today. It is a, um, a, an unhinged from any authority outside of a person. They're not looking for any outside um, direction or parameters within which to think. It's all generated from inside, right? It's a personal reflection. I, I think this is how it should be, and so it is. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good kind of faith, right? And, and we laugh about that, but I tell you, there are some times we're like, we can do the same thing. We can do what, what we call isogesis of the Scripture. We can read what we want the Scriptures to say, right? So don't be, we have to be careful here because um, we can do any of these four, and there's, there's certainly more. Well, what kind of faith does God commend? That is really what Hebrews 11 is all about. Would you agree? By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. There's a kind of faith that God is commending. I want, to give us, I want to give you a definition of faith as I think about it in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is a confident action in response to what God says. Faith is a confident, that's a Hebrews chapter 12, verse one word, conviction, confidence. And what is hope for, that's what faith is. Faith is a confident action in response to what God says. It's probably better definitions, but that's the one I'm working on this morning. So a question you can ask by way of evaluation before we even talk about these six types of faith that we learn about in Hebrews 11 is, is that true with you? Are, are you a man? Are you a woman? Are you a child that is all about confidently having confident action in response to what God says to you. Is that really what you want? Because this is what Hebrews 11 is after, this type of faith. It's a faith that has this deep-rooted conviction or confidence that says, I've heard from God, I know what He wants me to do, and so I'm going to step out and I'm going to do that. A confident, confident? God wants you to be confident in Him and in His Word, His commitment to you. Um, a confident 
action in response to what God says. This kind of faith looks like this. First one produces bold action in response to God's word. Uh, every one of these people were visited by God, God and, and God said something to them, and they stepped out and followed through with bold action, with courage, with integrity. They knew what God wanted, and they went ahead and did, and, and did whatever it was that God said. That's what they, by faith, by faith, by faith, every one of these people did something in response to what God said to them, Okay. So that's one part, that's, that's something hopefully that helps you understand what God is looking for uh, when he uh, looks at, at you and your heart and your response to him. Uh, another kind of faith that God says well done to is, is a life, is, is a, the faith that builds life on the promises of an unseen God. Over and over again, we see, uh, for instance, Joseph, by faith, predicted the exodus, which was going to be hundreds of years later, uh, and, and said, I want, when, when you all leave Egypt and go to the promised land, I want you to take my bones with you. This, this was hundreds of years then before they were released. Um, but, so it's a crazy thing to say. I mean, that they didn't even know uh, that they were going to leave Egypt. Right? It's crazy. It's just kind of lobbed right in there. But that's a type of faith that the Lord says... Well done, Joseph. Uh, well, that's simple. Oh, I think we're going to find over and over again. It's, it's really simple. The problem is it's not easy. All right? Abraham, get up from Ur, head for uh, the land of the Chaldeans, and then head for the land uh, where, actually, I'm going to bless you greatly. So it says that he got up and he went. I love Moses. First of all, Moses' parents weren't afraid of the king's edict, so they protected him and put him in a basket, floated down to Pharaoh's daughter. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew something that God had told them about this child, Moses. Moses' parents, by faith, did that. Has anybody, has any other parent that we know of in, in biblical times ever been asked to do that? No. And so, as I read Hebrews 11, I want you to know that God is going to speak to you very uniquely. There's none of these Hebrews 11 stories that have ever been repeated any place else. Similar principles we can learn, yes, but it's unique to you. God is calling to you to respond to him in faith. To give confident action in response to what God is saying to you. But this, this type of faith is a, is a faith that, that builds life on the promises of an unseen God. I, I love uh, Moses. So Moses' parents weren't afraid of the king's edict. Just a couple verses later it says, Moses wasn't afraid of the king. It's interesting, isn't it? That tells me that there was something that happened in Moses' parents' spirit that passed on into Moses' spirit. He wouldn't be afraid. And I would say that, it, and, and this is not, this is implication, this isn't directly from this text. I would say that the way that you are approaching your faith has an impact on those that will come after you. And so, please, uh, on behalf of your own soul, but also on behalf of those souls that are watching you, that are coming behind you, would you become a person of faith? the kind of faith that God is looking for, it has great impact. We, we know what the impact has on the other side, right? When someone doesn't trust God in the way that God has asked us to trust Him, right? Um, and life, I don't know about you, life is already hard enough. Um, number three, experiences this kind of faith that God commends, experiences God's working in extraordinary ways in the lives of very ordinary people in very ordinary circumstances. If you were going to write about the history of Israel and, and all, I'm not sure you would have picked out these stories. I mean, David is an afterthought. Gideon is an afterthought. Samuel is an afterthought. Rahab made the list. Oh, very ordinary people. 
in very ordinary situations. Can anybody relate? He says, God says, come on, trust me, right where you're at. I've got a word for you. I want you to step out in faith. I want you to trust me. And God is waiting on the edge, however that works, on the edge of heaven. This is not heaven. <laughs> this is a, an image. <laughs> he says, will you please trust me? And it's going to be a word to a very ordinary person in very ordinary situations that gets to latch on to an extraordinary God who says, come on, let's do this. And so be careful when I understand the Bible more, when I grow more, or when I'm in this particular situation. There's somebody in the room today, if they're ready to trust God for the very first time, even though they have no context of any of this, God says, that's who I'm looking for. Not the one that has learned to dress up and play churchianity, but the one who says, I want to respond with bold action to what you say to me today, God. And this is the kind of faith God's looking for. Aren't you glad? He's not looking for Samuel. He's looking for you. There's only one Abraham. There's only one you. And he says, come on, trust me. This kind of faith that God commends is not bound to any one set of circumstances. Read the circumstances of the people in Hebrews 11. All different. All complicated, frankly. Complex, like, huh? I mean, you read some of these stories, and when you go back in the Old Testament, you're like, that is silly. Right? Do you, it's crazy. Yields a variety of outcomes. There are immediate outcomes to your faith. There are delayed outcomes. Would you agree? It's my experience. There's some immediate responses. Sometimes it's delayed. Sometimes there's positive from my human perspective. Sometimes it's negative from my human perspective. I mean, they were sawn in two. Not what I'm looking for. Stoned to death. Is there a door number two, God? right? And this is the kind of faith that God rewards. God wants to reward this faith. He wants to use your life to reflect His glory and His majesty, His goodness to you and to those who get to watch you or read about you or hear about you even after you're gone. And so 2 Chronicles 16.9 says this. What, what kind of person trusts God like this? Very ordinary one from Abel to Rehab. 2 Chronicles 16.9. We're, we're moving towards application. Warning you. Okay? 2 Chronicles 16.9 says this. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Did you know this? to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards them and know their doctrine really well. No. You have done foolishly in this, Asa. This is King Asa, a word to King Asa. For from now on, you will have wars. Anybody in the room would like to stop the battle that you're in? Anybody in the room that needs to come to the Lord and make your life right before him today. He is looking at your heart, at my heart right now, wanting to strongly support those whose hearts are entirely his. And you can have all sorts of, but, 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 but I have or I haven't, or you have no idea. He says, I don't even care about your narrative. The only narrative that matters is mine, God says. And aren't you grateful? 
Because you and I are dead in our sins and our transgressions, but we are made alive in Christ. It is not dependent on what I have done or haven't done in the past. The only thing that matters is Christ right now in your life. And so he is saying, will you, by faith, trust me today? I have some things I want to say to you. But if you want, you can continue to be at war in your soul. That's what happened to Asa, king of Israel, a guy that should have known God. He said, no. Don't say no. I want to look at 2 Corinthians 13.5. This is that, that 2 Chronicles is Old Testament. You might be saying, well, what does the New Testament say about this? 2 Corinthians 13.5 says this, examine yourselves. Say what? To see whether you are in the faith. This is a significant issue in the New Testament. It's important that your faith is the real deal, not by your standard, but by the standard of God and His Word. Are you in the faith? Test yourselves. Use a standard that you didn't come up with. Or do you realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And so there's this precedent in Scripture. And, and 2 Corinthians is written to a, a church. <laughs> it's, not, it, it's not like Paul standing out in the corner of Corinth speaking this. He's talking to people in the church in Corinth. Perhaps he's speaking to the people in the church in Pleasant Valley. Examine yourself. Is your faith the real deal? Are you confidently moving to action in response to what God says? It's not enough just to be hang out until God's good to you or hang out until you get your theology straightened out. It's not good enough just to take a leap of faith. God has a word for you. He has direction for you. He has light for you. He knows what he's doing and he knows how to communicate to you. And so we're going to move into communion. If, if you're helping uh, me today serve communion, if you're on the worship team, Ryan, bring your group up, please. Um, we're going to move to communion. Now, there's a passage in, a, in one of the communion texts text in the New Testament that I want to highlight, kind of getting us ready for. And this is a great opportunity if, you're, if you are like me. Communion is a great opportunity to, to kind of slow the train down, kind of lean into the Lord and not partake this in an unworthy way. Would you agree? It's a great opportunity. Now, this, this table, this cup and this bread is open to you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And if this morning you are saying, God, I, I, I don't want to take this in an unworthy manner. I, I, I want to lean in, listen to you. So, so listen to the text in 1 Corinthians 11. This is the last part of it. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. That's a heavy statement. Would you agree? Let a person say the next word. Oh, I will preach the whole message over. Are you with me or not? You think I can't see you back there. I'm going to start over. Verse 28, let a person... I heard nothing over here. Let a person examine himself or herself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Discerning the body is referring here specifically to the body of Christ. Do you realize what he's done for you and me? He's paved the way to a relationship with God. This is not something just to 
kind of think, oh, it's just, it's just a kind of a church thing we do. You're proclaiming that you believe that he, he gave his body for you and he spilt his blood for you. Discern the body. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Say what? Is this significant? It must be. But if we judged ourselves truly, examine yourself. Be discerning. We would not be judged. God is inviting you to, by your own volition, come into the light and say, God, I need you. My life apart from you, quite frankly, is a sinful mess. I'm selfish. I'm lazy. I'm lustful. But here I am, God. I want you. And thanks be to God, you want me. And so uh, this is an open communion table. But if this morning is the time that you need to get your life right with God and you, you know it isn't, you know that you have maybe just been playing around with your faith, you can do that right where you're at. Say, Christ, I, I need you, I want you. And maybe you've been a believer for a long time, but you've drifted away. Just make your, right, make your life right with God. His eyes are moving to and fro throughout this room to see whose heart he might strongly support. Would you just let him have it this morning? Let him have your heart. Say, God, I, I don't care what it is that you say to me. I want to boldly respond with action to what you say to me. So the communion, for those of you that this is new for, the piece of bread that you will take represents the broken body of Jesus Christ given for you. The cup, the juice, represents the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you to cover you, to cover your past, your present, your future iniquity, transgressions, and sins. God is leaning into you. and He wants a relationship with you that is real that has a faith that he says well done to.